This is strange. Good evening, everybody. And um, for those of you on Zoom, do not shut off your Zoom. I am not Steve Target. Okay, you are at the right place. How are you? Steve, uh, unfortunately, cannot be with us tonight. Um, and um, I'm sure he's maybe tuned in virtually, but uh, we appreciate everything that he's done for all of these events and, and this one included. My name is Mike Piotrowitz. I'm the vice chair of the Union League Foundation. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the, to the public affairs program here this evening. Um, just a little bit about our foundation uh, before we get the program started. Um, the Union League Legacy Foundation is the nonprofit arm of the Union League. Uh, we are guided by our commitment to the United States Constitution, our belief in the free enterprise system, and the values of the Union League. And we'll continue to work in a nonprofit way to support those, those beliefs um, as, as we best can. Just our, our foundation does, does a lot of great things um, and they're all geared around um, either the preservation and expansion of our collectibles, uh, providing education and guidance for our youth consistent with our beliefs and our values here at the Union League, uh, providing scholarships uh, for deserving students, uh, the preservation of this great historic facility that we, that we all get to enjoy, and of course, doing things like tonight, bringing programs uh, to our members and their guests um, with the goal of creating informed, engaged citizens and better leaders in our community. So it, all of this is possible only with the complete generosity and support of our league members and the tireless work of our volunteers and in the program area led by Steve Target and his committee. So thanks to all you Union League members for your continued support to everything we're doing here at our foundation. Um, we're, we're having a, a great time at the foundation level and, and uh, we look forward to uh, continue to expand what we're doing now and make ourselves even better and better so we can bring more to all of you. So tonight we have a great program, it's an exciting program for sure, as they all are, we have an hour. And if, um, if you know the person I'm about to uh, introduce you to, you probably know it will be an hour and no longer than that. Um, we will have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, if you, if you are live here in the audience, please just fill out the card that's on your seat and we'll be sure to get the, uh, the questions up to our guests. If you're at home, just uh, click on the Zoom icon on your computer and we'll, uh, we'll try and get those questions up here as well. So the program will be kicked off tonight by the leader of the Union League Legacy Foundation. And I look, I'd like to introduce you to Joan Carter to introduce our guests. Good evening. Our program tonight is broadcast from the Union League of Philadelphia, where due to COVID restrictions, we have a very small, but very elite, I might mention, uh, in-person group. Unfortunately, this small group is the largest that the Union League will, that will gather at the Union League on, or anywhere else in our city. Uh, for at least the next six weeks. Uh, this is brought to you the courtesy of the city of Philadelphia's new shutdown mandate, uh, which by the way, goes into effect in a few hours. So it is with this backdrop that we present what I think is a most timely topic, saving our cities. Uh, tonight's discussion will be led by Rob Wonderling. Rob is the president and CEO of the Greater Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce, uh, a business advocacy organization of member companies that pro growths, promotes growth and economic development in the 11 county Greater Philadelphia region. Uh, previously, Rob was a, uh, a senator in the state of Pennsylvania and he's involved in uh, many, many civic and charitable causes, and he is currently chair of the board of Ursinus College. Our guest this evening is Carl Schramm. Carl is an economist, entrepreneur, author, former president of the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation, 
and presently a professor at Syracuse University. Carl is the author of the book, Burn the Business Plan, What Great Entrepreneurs Really Do. His numerous articles have been published in the Wall Street Journal, Foreign Affairs Magazine, and the National Review. So this evening, it is my great pleasure, our last hurrah for six weeks, uh, oh. to introduce Rob Wonderling and Carl Schramm. Well, thank you, Joan, for that uh, gracious introduction and welcome to fellow leg members here in the house and those that are Zooming uh, remotely this evening and viewing via the Zoom. Uh, just to amplify what my good friend Mike Gatchevis said, if you do have questions, uh, please put them in the chat box. Uh, we're going to be uh, rifling through those uh, in short order. It really is an honor to spend time with you this evening, Carl. And uh, those of us that are members of the league know that uh, our motto, Amar Patre Duquette, and I want to substitute and suggest uh, what might be appropriate for our conversation this evening is Amora Civates Duquette, uh, love of our city leads. We don't want to see our city die. Uh, we love it. Uh, we want to do everything we can to save it. And particularly as we're uh, wrestling with a resurgence of, of an insidious virus. And as Joan mentioned, government mandated restrictions on gatherings on our economy. Uh, through the lens of public health and safety. Uh, so this is very timely. We're excited that you're here. You're not only a man of letters, uh, but an accomplished entrepreneur. And uh, those of us that have traversed both the academic world and the business world know that that is a unique combination of <laughs> skills. And you wear many hats, but the dual competence required uh, is, is laudable. And so again, thanks for joining us. You've brought rigor to your research around not only the history of urban America and major cities like Philadelphia, but you've also built a bit, a bit of a, a forecast, if you will, and a multi-pronged analysis that is antiseptic, which I absolutely love, but also serves in a very real sense, a guide for all of us that care deeply about the city of Philadelphia. So maybe walk us through a bit of, a bit of your approach. Well, thank you, and thank you very much for having me. I, I've been looking forward to this for weeks, and I must say the staff has been terrific in terms of preparing this. Um, my approach actually began, in a sense, this way. When I was president of the Kauffman Foundation, I became curious about some cities being the uh, cradles of more entrepreneurship on a per capita basis than other cities. And I was just curious about that. And it was hard to find researchers who would go do stuff under Kaufman sponsorship. But I, I, I worked and worked at it. But you, you know, when I left after 10 years, uh, I wasn't quite sure what would happen next. And suddenly a bunch of universities said, you know, you're gonna come teach here. And um, Syracuse University was in that flock. Syracuse is my hometown. My mother was alive. We own a house there. It's the only place I have real family. And I took that offer. Um, and when I got there, I was shocked. I left Syracuse after college at 21. It was a vibrant city. General Electric had 17,000 people there, a huge place that they'd done miniaturization of radar. They were, had a huge factory and Carrier was there and it was a tremendously wealthy city as were all the upstate cities. And it, it had been decimated. I hadn't actually gone to the city and seen it up close. And it, it sort of catalyzed my interest in this question of entrepreneurship and how city economies operated. So what brought me here was a recent article which basically claimed, I think in a daring way, I think I'm now old enough to say things that may be impolitic, but are true. So it goes to the question of the, the embrace of rigor if you will. And I, I've looked at the issue of cities that don't have much of a future. So I actually say we have dying cities. They can't be resuscitated. And as you said, nobody lives in a city that they want to see that happen. That's certainly not a single soul in Philadelphia wants to see a, a gloomy future for Philadelphia or any city you can fill in the blank. So I, I be, you know, if you're going to make this claim, you've got to get to it. So essentially, I established two criteria. One was the loss of population, and the other was the increase of the population in poverty. 
So in the 17 cities that I think are in dire trouble, very dire trouble, you see a loss of population in the last 40 years of at least 30%. In some cases like Detroit, it's, it's more than 50%. And at the same time, you're watching an increase, a doubling at least of the population in poverty. Now put those two things together and you've an ed mixture that is very hard to overcome. Last point I'd make is we have this sort of, uh, I don't know, it's, it's sort of like a, a jolly atmosphere of how we can save cities. And there are four or five theories about how you do it and the consultancies around it. And I'll just enumerate them very quickly. None of them work. And to get to the last point I'm going to make, we have no set formula to, to turn a city around. There's no empirical evidence we've ever done it. And this echoes actually the book, uh, Burn the Business Plan, because uh, right there, I'm also quite empirically cr cr critical of how we go about trying to stimulate entrepreneurship. But to the city issue, you can build stadia, done work, okay? You can try and get the creative class to come and move here by building an arts district and so forth. You can establish an entrepreneurial matrix. It hasn't happened. Actually, Philadelphia happens to be one kind of exception because of the Men Franklin Fund. Um, the only exception, by the way. Um, and th there are a, a host of other things that, that consultants sell. Michael Porter says, well, we'll have a cluster, okay? None of that has ever happened in an American city or a city around the world. So the question comes, so what, what really will work? And how can we turn this around? The net of it all is, as I say, we have 17 cities. I suspect by the time we count the 2020 population, it'll be 20 cities. And at the other end, very, very hopeful business is we have over 50 cities in the United States where the population is growing by an inopposite amount proportionately, and the population poverty is shrinking. These are, these are cities in the United States that seem to be flourishing. So the course I teach is called uh, why flourishing cities fail and what can be done about it. And that's the article that, that brought me, I think, to the current attention of, of the league. So you may have heard uh, about a famous Philadelphia named Rocky. Uh, we all metaphorically run up those steps and refuse to throw in the towel every day. So I refuse to buy into um, uh, what I think is your initial hypothesis. So I want to probe a little bit deeper as to the cities that are flourishing. What, what is the secret sauce? What are the ingredients that you see? Again, you know, antiseptic rigor, I get you, not boutique consulting du jour, but really where you see the mix that is plotting such an optimistic future for those cities. Well, there's a macroeconomic matrix that has to be in place. And uh, one of the reasons we see such flourishing, if you will, in Florida cities and Texas cities, um, in Arizona, it, it, you know, there's a professor at Harvard who says just the weather, okay? It's snow, so people, this, this is, not, it's lots more than the weather. It's the macro conditions of growth, uh, as in Florida, zero state income tax. I, I just had a specialist come talk to our students in my course on the debt burden by city in New York State, okay? And, and it, you can't overcome it. So the issue of, you know, the bad debts that have loaded up and what you do, you, the freedom you do to change tax policy is so restricted. That's one thing. Um, and we go through some of the economic issues uh, uh, and they basically touch some of the uh, touchstones of the values of this, this, the, the league in the sense of freedoms, if you will. But there's another issue uh, that I've been probing more and more with our students and it's civic values. And once upon a time when we all grew up, and there are lots of people here, at least my age, or, or getting close to my age, um, from the downside, um, we knew what it was like to be a Syracusean. That was a shared civic value. If you went to Rochester, you know, we have this in American literature, where people get on the train and they start to brag on their cities, right? And these cities were all engines of a particular product for America, right? Rochester made the world's cameras. Syracuse made the world's air conditioning. Philadelphia made the world's locomotives, among other things. It's a much bigger city, much bigger economy. And, and that's how our economy is woven together. And that's not so much the case anymore with our new economy. And the, the difficulty is we have cities that are bursting. They're making, they're self-sustaining economically. 
And then we have some cities trailing that can't sustain themselves and have to be supplicant cities. And this is a very difficult exchange. So on your first point, and we'll start a little tally about our own city of Philadelphia, uh, having a business friendly government, a low tax or efficient system of government that uses resources, public resources wisely is a foundational yes. aspect of a city that flourish. Second, uh, a bit of going back in time, but also a reset for the future in terms of establishing civic values. And, and I would argue as a league member, uh, that's right in our wheelhouse. Uh, how are we engaging as members in the intellectual debate that's underway vis-a-vis uh, -vis free enterprise, capitalism, movements around the destruction and redistribution of such? Uh, feels like we should be joined in that debate in a more public way, but my editorial comment. Uh, so part of this is talent, population. You mentioned census, and we'll see how Philadelphia does in the upcoming census. There were some rosy scenarios that we thought we'd have a net gain of about 100,000 more citizens. I'm not sure now uh, how that will play out. Um, but part of that, building that knowledge base, that talent base is education. And what are your thoughts on the educational system? Well, it's funny, when we put this in the context of civic values and the, the importance of the talent level. Can people participate in the world economy that, that challenges them? And I, I think it makes huge sense to start right at education. Um, just if we go to the civic values issue, I was reviewing this with my students the other day and I probed and said, you know, the traditional ways we moved our civic values along and let's call them pro-social values, if you will. What, what's it mean to be a citizen? My responsibility to you if we live in the same city and so forth. What's our common uh, exchange and our, our common value set? And of course I said, first thing uh, that makes sense to me is the uh, uh, basic evaporation of, of churches and parishes in the cities, you know, in churches, were one of the ways we actually move this forward. Schools, as we know, um, and I don't need to dwell on this, but I see it as a university professor. You know, when I get a, a, a bunch of kids in, I, I ask them, you know, who, who wrote your high school history book? And most of them don't know it, but once in a while they say, it was Zen, uh, Howard Zen, okay? Well, it's, it's an anti-American history book, okay? So I know I gotta deal with there. And, and that goes to the question of how you convey social values, pro-social values, pro-American values, if you will. And last week, my students did a great surprise on me and they said, you know, we have to look to the family. And some years ago, there was a challenge by Governor Cuomo to the mayor of Syracuse. He was dangling and what, I don't think it was serious, but she had to take it seriously. And I took it seriously because she asked me, uh, I'll make you a billion dollar gift from the state if you come up with a great way to resuscitate Syracuse. And I said to the mayor, develop a pro-family, you're a Democrat, develop a pro-family thesis here of how this city is gonna strengthen families. Get fathers back into the home, right? Get jobs, start role modeling and so forth. Um, she chose to propose $800 million uh, for sewer and new, new water pipes. So uh, that, that's not one of those ideas that stirs men's souls. And, or women's souls either. And, uh, you know, stir something. It didn't, it didn't, yeah, stir something, but it, it didn't come to pass. But uh, it, 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 I, I was very proud of the students to actually understand that the, the, it's the family where these pro social values, pro civic values, uh, pro community values are, are really inculcated and move forward. It feels like that's really hard to do in a distributed digital an accelerated digital economy as a result of a pandemic that happened very quickly. I was a bit taken aback by uh, our Fed Chairman uh, Powell's comments out on the West Coast earlier this week where he said, we're in a major new uh, economy, it'll never be what it was pre-pandemic. Most of that being driven by knowledge-based industries, accelerated uh, commitments to uh, technology. How do you see that playing in and particularly for cities like Philadelphia that haven't made your dying list just yet, I don't think, I hope not, but I don't think we're on a flourishing list either. I like to be optimistic and say, you know, we're at a fork in the road. How would you build those civic ethos in a more distributed technologically 
dare I say, narrow hashtag driven age? Yeah, that's a terrific question because I think I agree with Chairman Paul. We, we, it's good that you say crossroads. I think we've gone right into a crossroads and in a sense are stuck looking around. It's a certainty our economy and our society, more importantly, are getting reordered right underneath us. And I, 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 my, my wife who's in the back hears me complain about this all the time. We see no contemporary critical analysis of this. We have just, just not, nothing being offered up in the newspaper columns or anything about what this radical, profound shift is. And uh, I puzzle with this with the students all the time in the sense of how is your life going to be different? They're looking for jobs. We puzzle about this in terms of what office buildings are going to be, okay? And as I said just a moment before we started, <clears throat> I've, teach, I've taught this here completely on Zoom, um, you know, from Baltimore to Syracuse because I'm over 65, I can't go on the campus. Those are the rules, okay? Those are the rules. Uh, we don't know if those rules make sense from an epidemiological perspective, from a virology perspective, but we sure know things are gonna be radically different. Because mm -hmm. um, if, if you said a year ago, you know, you're gonna teach next year on Zoom. Say, What's Zoom, right? Um, and here, here we are, I'm a master teacher on Zoom, I think, you know? Um, and it's fantastic. And actually, in some ways, it's an improvement on face-to-face. Because when you have that Zoom gallery, you see every student's face. You know where their eyes are. You know whether you got them engaged. I, I feel like I just finished one of my courses yesterday and said, you know, strangely, I feel like I know you better than any group of students I have ever taught before. Okay? And then I said, do any of you know how tall I am? Right? So. You know, they, they, you know it's a, it tells you we're in a disconnect of a sort. We are in a bit of a disconnect, but when you, I imagine you're the instructor on the Zoom call, so you control the remote control, so no one is flipping to uh, other stations uh, along the way. <laughs> you're also an entrepreneur, and uh, it's also part of your secret sauce as you antiseptically evaluate cities. You know, it's been said about Philadelphians uh, compared to, say, other places that are a hotbed of entrepreneurship, like Silicon Valley, that if someone gets fired or laid off out in the West Coast, they go start a company. If a Philadelphia loses their job doing a layoff, they get their resume in order and go look for the next job. Uh, how do you see entrepreneurship, particularly in a post-pandemic age, how would you play those cards expertly for a city like Philadelphia? That's a terrific question because so much of it is in a sense cultural, okay? And there are signals that come from government that are really critical. And as you enumerated them a few minutes ago about taxes and such like, I would add one more and it's the regulatory environment. And everybody thinks, oh yeah, that's the rote stuff. But um, you know, uh, five or six years ago, I had an excited conversation in a course I teach called Introduction to Innovation. And a student came out in the hall after we were done and described a business to me. And it was okay. I mean, you know, in my life, if you write a book on entrepreneurship, people in the street come up and describe businesses to you. And um, this was a good idea. But the reason I bring it up is the student said, this is five years ago, do you suppose the government will let me do this? Hmm. And I thought that, that it was an arresting comment hmm. uh, for, for an American, for a kid, okay, uh, to, to say that. And I think more and more, and this is very local, by the way, we've done, when I was at Kaufman, we did a lot of studies about this. The regulation that is most burdensome, that, that dampens entrepreneurship more than anything, is not federal, it's not state, it's local. Uh, most of our businesses are small businesses, and if you have to wait eight months to get a building inspector to approve your retail store, okay, or go on and on if you're selling food, health departments, and so forth, this is an enormous burden. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it's just never weighted properly. And it, it's a really critical issue. Well, it is for Philadelphia, pre-pandemic, if you wanted to open up a restaurant in town, it would take anywhere between 18 and 24 months, uh, north of a hundred steps uh, mm -hmm. that would be required. Now in a pandemic, we estimate that maybe we will have 40% of our restaurant industry just never come back yeah. again. Yeah. 
we've been spending an awful lot of time with our, our city uh, governmental officials with what we're calling our do no harm approach. And that is, please do not do anything legislatively that would harm particularly our small businesses and our neighborhood based businesses during this really fragile time. Tickets we're going through as Joan Carter suggested or indicated more, more restrictions. Can we talk a little bit about the Union League? I'm very intrigued by uh, your concepts of, of the, the, the civic obligation of an institution like our league to not end up on a dying list, but on a flourishing list. And with everything that's around us, and you know our history, what, what guidance would you give to, to all of us as members of this, of this organization? Well, I think uh, as I was thinking about this issue, and, and I've been thinking about this issue for a little bit because I, I, it, it goes to the issue of uh, our pro-social values, our shared values in the community. And you know, this is not written about in contemporary terms, but there's a Philadelphian, but as some of you know, Joe Phil Rosso uh, put me onto this, Digby Boltzell, I've read everything he's written. And you know what's extraordinary about this is, is he's talking about the extraordinary differences in civic values. Boston to Philadelphia. He relates it to the religious basis of congregationalism versus friends. And th this is how profoundly important this is. And it is never, ever written about in contemporary literature. And if you think about, and I, I go very softly here because I, I, I know reputational high points, the top of the waves of the Union League Club, there aren't many of these types of institutions in other cities that, mm. that trace back, I, I could interpret your history in the time of the Civil War of trying to teach the city about the importance of abolition and, and how important it was to hold the union together and how important it was to fight this fight. And while that was a hotbed, for example, in my hometown in Syracuse, there's no contemporary organization that says, yes, those were our roots, okay? We made the city an abolitionist city. We were part of the Underground Railroad. It's all, it's all lost, but those were all pro-social. Hmm. They, they were hugely pro-American. Um, and now, unfortunately, on college campuses, you know, the Civil War is so, it, it's, it's trivialized as something that happened and not that important. And, you know, worse, it, it um, you know, institutionalized institutions that shouldn't have been institutionalized in slavery and so forth. Um, so I, I think in a sense, as I've thought about this, and this is a pretty grand and dangerous thing to say, uh, the Union League might be able to articulate for others as a model of, of what goes on, okay? My life is spent in Baltimore, there's nothing like this. There's a historical society, but it collects plates and antique furniture and silverware, right? Wait, that's what my wife does. <laughs> and you know, there's really nothing in a sense like this in New York. There's a historical society, but there's, there's, there's not this commitment to our, our devotion to the city's values in a sense and its history. Well, you're very diplomatic because I think in your response was a challenge to us all because uh, the values that drove the founding of this league from which the battle was joined, literally, uh, not, just, not just figuratively, right. Those values are still so important today, but the battlefield uh, is different uh, in, in the city of Philadelphia. And I do think there's a vacuum uh, that perhaps our membership at some point in time may wanna, wanna explore a bit more how we would uh, be engaged uh, in that. Uh, yeah, well, you know, one of the, the contests, of course, is to come forward with an agenda like that which is your historic agenda, is now dismissed as sort of an elitist set of irrelevant, which was again, pro-social things. Who, 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 who are you to set this agenda in a sense? But this agenda is so critical, it's so critical. Uh, I, I would urge you to think in the most creative ways to think about how this is insinuated into issues that relate to civic values, school, transmission of these civic values, to even understand them. Again, to, to go to uh, the work of, of uh, uh, Baltzell here is th these, these are things that aren't even spoken of today. 
Correct. And, and just to reignite that fire is a legitimate business of all people, not elites of all people, as, as the means by which you bring a society and a community together, it can't be understated in terms of its importance. If we were doing live television or tape television, this is where we'd have a commercial break. Uh, we're not, but it reminded me of the good mission of the legacy foundations uh, at the LIG, right? The, the, as, as Michael said at, at the beginning, philanthropy pushed through the community to change a life or lives with the values of the LIG. Uh, so now back to our show. Um, <laughs> we've talked a little bit about history. Let's, let's talk about the future and young uh, individuals. And this question comes uh, from the audience. What do young people need to learn to start down that road to entrepreneurship? How can schools and teachers and parents help? Well, I think, again, that's almost like a setting of a context. And one of my quarrels with how we do this in the United States is we now formalized it. Um, you know, if you go back in time when I started my first company, um, the word entrepreneur was not part of the common parlance in America. Uh, we started many more businesses back then and back, back in the 1950s. It's estimated that 40% of the people who came back from World War II started a business. Wow. Um, and we thought of them as businessmen. When I look back in my childhood, those are the people who lived up and down my street, right? And if you said, you know, Stenard Avenue, which is the same block in which Joe Biden lived when he was a law student, okay? Uh, this is a street full of entrepreneurs that say, you know, stop with that French talk, okay? Uh, so the first thing is we, we've formalized it. Um, and it's a, it's a very informal process. So the notion that we teach this in universities as a formal doctrine that's never been investigated empirically is nuts. And I think if the, you were to ask, well, prove it, I'd say the one statistic of all consequence in my book is this. People are, when they start businesses, on an average age in the United States, 38 or 39. Hmm. And when I discovered that, and you know, at Coffin, we were trying to empirically strip out what goes on with entrepreneurs. And I did it in the context, not of my experience, I did it in the context of the macroeconomic contribution of entrepreneurs to America. It's Joseph Schumpeter. It's the entrepreneurs who refresh our economy. We need more of them, and we need lots more of them right now, uh, anytime we get to a crisis. And it's, an, it's, it's not quite understood at all by economists. You know, we saw a piece in the Wall Street Journal say, oh, there's a boom in entrepreneurship. Yeah, we'd like to believe that. But at the same time, are these survivable businesses or not? There's a big macroeconomic, uh, you know, matrix in which this happens. So <clears throat> the first thing is we can't formalize it. It's, it's, it's informal. We can establish institutional uh, support systems but we have to be very careful about that. And um, many places it's become formulaic. Uh, one of the things that gets me, uh, you know, happy returns in a lot of business schools is, you know, I asked the question, how many of the professors of entrepreneurship ever worked in a startup or started one? And it's less than 50%, you know, so the magic question comes along, would you study, you know, surgery if you want to be a doctor with a doctor who never went to the operating room? Okay, you know, the obvious answer. Uh, but uh, Philadelphia, by the way, as I mentioned before, hinted at before, there's something that goes on here. Philadelphia is a very, very, very leading edge of establishing a venture fund for locality, uh, the Ben Franklin Fund. Right. And the reason I know that is we examined over 200 of those funds when I was at Kaufman, because that's a ready thing that people do. And they're not all the same. Philadelphia said that this fund is the only one that produces a positive return, which means the entrepreneurs they bet on are different from the entrepreneurs they bet on in other cities, um, which tells us something. I'm not quite sure what it is, but I know it's a positive sign. Well, part of that might be that uh, the, the, the science is being created in our, in our university enterprises. We've got a high concentration of those in the city and the region, 100 or so colleges and universities. You cited your work at Kaufman back to the lack of entrepreneurship in the city. And, and I remember the Kaufman analysis that always indicated that Philadelphia as a city would uh, create a, a year over year 
a really large number of sole proprietorships. I guess that's the good news. According to Kaufman data, though, we were never really able to convert those into enterprises uh, to build that density, that ecosystem. And it's, a, I think, now more than ever a, a requirement. You mentioned the creative class and creative economy uh, when we first began our conversation. And a question here, which I might paraphrase a bit, that there are cities, including Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and other locales that have made big bets around arts and culture. We have the Avenue of the Arts, the League House sits on the Avenue of the Arts. But also during the pandemic, there's been an awful lot of street closures and trying to sort of amp up experience. Um, is, is that a concrete viable solution? I was curious, and maybe mirror that back to your comment about creative class and placemaking maybe not be what it's all meant to be by- Yeah. The, if you reduce my uh, prescription, it comes down to an indigenous entrepreneurship. It's a, it's a uh, sui generis in the Latin phrase. It springs up, uh, if you will, out of the ground. There's a population here, something happens. As you say, in Philadelphia, lots of sole proprietorships happen, okay? And they don't happen at the same rate in, in, in other cities. But then the question is, so what do you do about it? And one of the things that I, I caution here, and I had mentioned before, when people say it's, it's the creatives, okay? Uh, Shram would say it's the local creatives. Uh, a lot of mayors and city councils have been fleeced by consultants who operate on this theory that there's this floating, transient, non-settled group of students who are all creative. And if we can put the right bait in the water, they'll come here and resuscitate our, our, you know, you, you chuckle, but that is actually the formula of selling this type of consultancy. And the reality is students aren't like that. And the reality is most students from most universities stay where they are. If, if you look at Harvard, over 40% of the kids at Harvard are from Massachusetts, all right? It's a local university, really, okay? And it's the same thing here. The University of Pennsylvania is a local university. Uh, its graduates are mostly going to stay here. And so the question is, you know, these are the indigenous, this is the indigenous talent. And it, I, I think it's actually quite dangerous to think that our indigenous talent isn't equal to what goes on in, in the Silicon Valley. Yes, that's a draft off the top of all the talent that goes there because of the differential in, in um, economic returns. But, but, you know, I, track, I, I test this constantly with my students in terms of, they, they don't want to leave their hometowns. Um, I have a student who I, I said yesterday, I'm going to talk to the Union League in Philadelphia. You're from Pittsburgh, okay? What's so different about Pittsburgh from Philadelphia? I, want to, I, I really want to know your view. Well, one of football team is undefeated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, she's a student at Syracuse University. She's going to live the rest of her life in Pittsburgh. That, that is her home and glory to her, okay? She's gonna make Pittsburgh work. And that's a much more common reality than we think that we have to go clamp these students in place. It's indigenous entrepreneurship. Well, I think we pre-pandemic had a bit of the, the, the wind at our back 25, 30 years ago, about 15 to 17% of students graduating from our college universities would flee. They were, they were leaving the region. I think last year's graduation number was around 65% staying. So that's good news to, to build out that reservoir of talent. Uh, you've compared a lot of cities around the world. Is it worth having a conversation about Philadelphia as compared to cities outside the US or is it just really apples and oranges? Uh, it, it's, it's apples and oranges. Okay. Everything is different in terms of home ownership, racial composition, the social support systems, no. I only ask the question because increasingly we keep hearing, yeah. whether it's the pandemic or school, public education, if you only did it like fill in the blank, right? It's yeah, usually Singapore, abroad, yeah, right? Hong Kong, or yes, yes. Uh, no. So we should avoid those consultants when they come knocking on our doors. Uh, yeah, I mean, okay. Singapore is a special case. You know, I had a long talk with a student today about Singapore. Dubai is a special case. Abu Dhabi is a special case. Uh, you know, unless they find an oil field under Philadelphia. <laughs> um, 
you know, and uh, by the time the green movement gets over, you better exploit it in the next three days. <laughs> this is an interesting question, and it's actually it's quite provocative, and I and and I think it could also be slightly depressing. So I I want to frame it in a way that is the rooted optimism of our league. We're in a really rough time right now. Mm -hmm. And you always hate to say, gee, if we hit rock bottom, it's just as bad as it can get, who knows? It could get worse, we don't know. But we're on, we're in dire straits. Yes, and the, the, the root of this question is, if you consider, as Joan indicated, another six weeks, who knows, if not longer, of mandated closing our economies, uh, who knows how the virus will continue to move into our lives and even though net mortality rates are on the decline, we're gonna have a huge budget issue at the state and particularly at the city level next year. So are we at a point of, of just being on the mat that there's this moment we could really remake ourselves and that are we that close to hitting rock bottom that, uh, you know, I keep using the, the phrase secret sauce, are, are the ingredients there for us to then begin that, that positive momentum towards flourishing? I'd like to believe they are. And I think this may be one of those moments where if uh, somehow the federal government fails to lead, which it could do, okay, or there's a resistance to the federal government, we could watch much of the experimentation happen. I suspect, I just have a hunch, we're gonna see really statistically significant changes in terms of how some states and cities come back versus other cities. Um, you know, I had my students, uh, their last essay, I just finished reading them last night. I had them look at uh, a chapter in Fred Siegel's book, The Future Happened, The Future Once Happened Here. And it's a story about how Fiorello LaGuardia and his very cozy relationship with FDR made New York in the depression. It, it really survived great, but Siegel makes the case that of all the cities in America, it was like a drug. New York got hooked on federal support and has never, ever recovered from it. And, and this is really interesting to watch these, these potential histories different from place to place. Um, you know, Philadelphia is a lot more vibrant in, in, in many, many ways, and its contest has always been with New York. Um, but in the end, uh, you know, I, I'm not versed enough about this, but New York has got mm. probably the most significant problems of survival of any city in the United States. Here's a question. Is your argument, and we're going back to the creatives, uh, is your argument in favor of local creators to help dying cities an argument against national corporations that may occupy that same space? And as referenced in the example, we were in the hunt for a period of time to be the location for the uh, Amazon HQ2 uh, open source uh, metro competition nationally. Uh, how, how do national corporations that are continually trying to build a creative, their business model is to be creative, right? At the end of the day, Amazon's yep. an algorithm and yep. figuring it out and next thing you know, you control another market. Um, how do you see uh, large multinationals fitting into the futures broadly and creative well, specifically? Well, a couple of things to remember, and that is the velocity of the change in terms of who these great corporations are is faster than ever before, all right? You know, we thought a few, few days ago that Twitter actually owned the space. Hmm, not quite so sure. Their competitors growing up, okay? We're hearing the first charges about thinking about antitrust law, which means we're gonna change, if, if that comes to pass, we're about to really change some of those big international corporations. We have to remember there's another condition that's dampening entrepreneurship, at least in my view, and that is the consolidation of innovations into these companies. In the course I teach on innovation, we spend a lot of time in terms of do big firms know how to innovate anymore, or do they just know how to buy small firms for their innovation? And the fact is, as, as many of you will appreciate, the listed companies in the stock exchange is half of what it was 20 or 30 years ago, which tells us a lot about consolidation. And that has a step down effects in terms of where entrepreneurs see their institutional formation. One of the points I make in my book is 
When people started businesses in the 40s, 30s, 20s, other people who started Procter & Gamble in, let's say, 1860 or 1840, Procter & Gamble didn't start that business even understanding what the phrase exit strategy is. People start businesses, and most entrepreneurs still start businesses. Is this going to be my life's work? It's going to be an institution, okay? It, it really saddens me, and it's one of the things I charge against and, and burn the business plan, that the day you conceive of your business, you think about how you're going to dump it, right? And I had some guy come see me some years ago. He said, I got this new tool, blah, 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 blah. And when it's all done, I sell the company to Home Depot. And I said, click. Okay, that's not how people start businesses. They start businesses out of an instigation, of love for the idea, exploring the idea, building an institution, passing it on to their kids, giving it to the community. Um, this is what business people do. Uh, it, it's not about... I'm going to get rich real quick, and uh, one of the things that bothers me endlessly is the introduction of an entrepreneur. I said, you know, his, his first company he got 200 million when he sold it to, right? That's not our measure, right? Yeah, when you sold it to the company unnamed, okay, they killed it, right? You feel good about that, you know? You could, you you gave up the competition, and unfortunately, there's a lot of that goes on. Carl, you speak your mind. Uh, yeah. And that's refreshing because this question gets to our First Amendment rights, particularly through the lens of entrepreneurship in the business community. And there is this underlying, I use the word fear, that suggests that we've vested way too much power in government. You mentioned the regulatory state, particularly at the local level. We just went through, continuing to go through an election process. Uh, but the, the question is really rooted in how can we speak our mind how can we talk openly about the values of free enterprise and entrepreneurship without being canceled or censored or cut off on, on social media? Because, and I, th I think this is a brilliant question, toggling back and forth between entrepreneurial spirit and that first amendment uh, that we have in our constitution is so critical to build a lasting business that isn't sold quickly for 200 million to your last comment. What are your thoughts on that? Well, two things. I'll go first to the preface of I speak my mind. Um, you know, we're, we're watching right now uh, two bishops, the Bishop of Brooklyn and the, the Archbishop of San Francisco, sue. It's the issue about you, you can have 40 people in a restaurant. I can have one person in my church. Okay. Let's, let's get clear about this. You're trying to stamp out religion. Or at least that's what it looks like. Two bishops. I heard one. Described the other day, he said, you know, the Bishop of uh, Brooklyn is old enough that he doesn't care anymore what the Pope thinks, right? And maybe I'm old enough that I, I don't really care, okay? Uh, it's, a, it's a freedom to speak your mind. Now, to, to your uh, larger question, you know, um, I was on the phone with a student today and talking about this First Amendment issue with an entrepreneur student um, and the limitations that Formal limitations on speech affect your brain. And the word I used was I said, I never use the word retard anymore. Now, retard is an engineering term. I want, I want to retard the machine's velocity, right? I want to retard this process. I want to retard the process of city decay. I never use the word anymore, right? Because it's, it's just verboten. They went through and scrubbed the federal register of the word retard. I use that word all the time as an, as an engineering and, and economics. I don't use it anymore. Now think of the deprivation of I have one fewer verbs to talk about a phenomenon. And the fact is, if you're on a university campus, you don't have one fewer verb. You have a jillion fewer words. You know, I walk on eggshells in a classroom. Um, lest I say something that, that disturbs someone, okay? And boy, do they get disturbed. The other day, uh, I was just mentioning, I said, did any of you see what happened in Washington last week? Well, the fact is, student uh, sources of news don't even cover it. And one student said, yeah, it was a riot by uh, white uh, uh, nationalists, right? And what it provoked was a tremendous amount of police brutality. Right. What a take on this, right? 
But when this goes to the issue of how we limit our words and speech, uh, if you don't think that has implications for people's creative juices upstairs, that they have to keep looking for the breaks, the walls, the guardrails where they can't speak, they are making a channels in their brain about what they can't think. And I think this is extremely serious. And does that correlate to curiosity? Sure, positively. Positively. Which is the key. I mean, if you take away the word, just take a word, take the word retard out of my brain. It, it limits my curiosity about velocity. Right? I might not have another good verb right there. Okay? And if I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm Westinghouse, and I'm going to invent brakes. Okay? I'm going to try and retard, you know, movement, speed, friction, or whatever. Right? And, and, and it's, a, it's a critical issue. Think about it this way. In, in my innovations course, I say human nature, we innovate for four reasons. We innovate in defense. We, we don't want you to come kill me. Second, we want to stop death. And right there is where we spend a huge amount of our public money in the NIH and in the Defense Department. Third, we want to speed communication. I want to know more faster, okay? Uh, and the fourth is entertainment. And one of the things that's going on right now is we have a culture of restricted entertainment and a huge more amount of time spent in entertainment. And to the extent we indulge in that, we're not out there doing more productive stuff in the other three areas. And, and this is all related to the limits of language as far as I see it. Interesting. You mentioned Zen earlier, and uh, this uh, question from the audience talks about young people today are really under that influence of Zen. Uh, okay. they're, they're in love with socialism and government providing solutions to all problems. So how do we push back? How do we continue to uh, be evangelists of the virtues of free enterprise? Well, you know, I, 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 I don't know if this is true. I'm pretty much invested in this, and I'm invested in this this week as opposed to where maybe I would have been last month, okay? I think this pendulum swings back and forth. And, um, you know, I read a piece not long ago about uh, what the new resistance is. I'm sorry, what said it? The new resistance is. What is you know? the new resistance? Well, we've watched for four years the resistance. And then suddenly, Who's going to be the new resistance? Hmm? And it may be the mantle shifts from one side to the other side. And the questions you pose about freedom of speech, and my answer about its implications for freedom of thought, uh, it's not you and me and a few people in Philadelphia who are really perturbed by this. Okay. And in time, we will, I trust that economists are going to write articles that actually make this point that uh, when, you, when you clamp down on speech, you limit thought, the spectrum of things that people are gonna be creative about goes down and it'll show up in GDP. We just have a few moments uh, remaining and the questions have been really, really outstanding this evening. We appreciate everybody's interaction and input. Carl, um, this is not a fair question, but you, you call them like you see them. Can you give a forecast for American cities, and particularly Philadelphia, let's say the next five to 10 years? Well, it's hard to do, and among other things, it's hard to do is because we're watching a flare up in a few cities. This is one of them, unfortunately, of outright violence, okay? It's not peaceful protests as my students sometimes protest. It's peaceful protests. No, <laughs> it, it's, it's riots, okay? I'm old enough to have lived through the resistance to Vietnam. I saw it up close. I was at the University of Wisconsin. I've seen it. Uh, this act has been performed before. And the good news is America recovered. And I want to tell you, as some people in the audience would know, in those days, um, families were horribly split. People thought this was the end of the republic. We'd never be able to do it. You got no leadership out of President Johnson until he basically gave up. Um, we've been through dark, dark times before. Now, it hadn't been really specific to places where people have said, you know, we're going to really do it here. And I think local political circumstances are of really great consequence. I'm, I'm a big fan of the police chief of Detroit, who basically says, never going to happen here, okay? Uh, 
in, and this is really important because what we're watching at this sophisticated period in our history is we're watching a bunch of cities put their hands up and say, yeah, it's okay. We, we don't care. This is, this is Baltimore where I live proximate to. Let people exercise those rights and burn it off. What are you kidding? This is private property. This is, and this is the private property that supports that community. It's, it's crazy thinking. And other cities are basically a lot more logical about this and understand the longer term. So I, I think in that context, it's hard, it, it's really hard to predict. I'm gonna retreat to basically saying, you know, as an economist, I like to look at the big forces that are driving things underneath and not the sort of flash mobs that may afflict Philadelphia now and, you know, will lenient prosecutors in California or this part of the world or that part of the world. Those are important in the short term, the long term, is, is these macroeconomic forces, the talent levels, if you can keep the talent, what are the pro-social values that move forward that make a city more competitive because people are, are networked together, they help each other. They, these are the profound issues, I think, that, that hold the secret of whether or not cities succeed or don't. Well, Carl, uh, we could have this conversation well into the night uh, when the restrictions do take effect, Joan. <laughs> And for those, this might be for your own self-indulgence for those who are on the Zoom call, but maybe telepathically hit the reactions button with a nice thumbs up for uh, Carl and a round of applause here at the League House for what was just an outstanding uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Oh, let's put, let's put some of shaking hands in years. <laughs> Carl, Rob, thank you. Thank you so much for a, a very informative uh, program. Um, as I sit out here, I'm, I'm feeling good about Philadelphia. Um, we, we, got, we got work to do, for sure. Um, but you talk about the Ben Franklin Fund, uh, you talk about the big focus and where we're going, you talk about keeping our talent. Um, we're, we're, we're a city that keeps our people. And um, I think people make are what makes the world go round. And uh, we, we've got plenty of challenges out there. But uh, we we would look forward to having you back someday when this is all over and, and we're talking about uh, how we all came through it. It would, be a, it would be a great joy for us to have you back again. And, and we do appreciate your sharing with us, your, your wisdom, your knowledge, and your expertise. So thank you very much. Thank you all for joining um, Zoom or in person, hopefully primarily on Zoom hundreds of you out there. Uh, our next program is, uh, is a Civil War Roundtable program. Uh, Candace Hooper is our, uh, is our guest. Uh, the, the title of the program, Lincoln's General's Wives, Four Women Who Influenced the Civil War for Better or for Worse. Got to be a real interesting program. Um, for better or for worse, mostly worse, that will be on Zoom 100%. But thank you all for joining us. Enjoy your evening. Thank you.